This is a video on causes of school failure and behavioral issues in pediatrics. I'll be presenting this list of possible disorders that can cause school failure and or behavioral issues in kids. Um, I'll kind of be breaking them down, putting them into categories, and um, these is, this is essentially a list of things you should think of if you have a patient that isn't doing so well at school or that's having some behavioral issues. So let's first break them down. First, we have these sleep disorders, poor sleep hygiene, narcolepsy, insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, and central sleep apnea. Uh, these few are somatic disorders. So these are actual like structural problems, as in obstructive sleep apnea, uh, sensory impairment. You might have vision or hearing loss. We have developmental disorders, like learning disabilities, including intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorders. And lastly are these psych disorders that can significantly impact a kid's performance. So ADHD, OD, CD, mood, um, so essentially, uh, essentially depression and anxiety at the end. So let's talk about these one by one. First, poor sleep hygiene. Uh, there are a couple signs of poor sleep hygiene. Um, this is a list of them. These are the most common things. Essentially, you only want to use your bed for food. Uh, sorry, you only want to use your bed for sleeping. So any kid that's uh, eating or playing on their phone or reading in bed might have poor sleep hygiene just because they're used to doing other things in bed. You want to associate the bed with just sleep, um, and that'll help the kid um, fall asleep when they go to bed um, more, more quickly. A screen in the bedroom is generally a bad idea. Um, kind of want to stop screens maybe an hour or two before going to sleep. Inconsistent schedule is also a problem, so you want to make sure that your bedtime, your routine before bedtime, your alarms in the morning are always at the same time every day. It helps to do this on the weekends as well. Um, that's a good sleep hygiene practice. You, of course, want to avoid any kind of stimulants before sleep, so caffeine, alcohol, nicotine are the common ones. Um, no caffeine probably starting at noon. Um, alcohol and nicotine, ideally you would have none, um, definitely not before sleep. Daytime naps can ruin your sleep schedule. And you also want to avoid any kind of engaging activities, mentally or physically, uh, too close to bedtime. So that also includes any kind of bright lights too close to bedtime, so that's the reason for no screens in the bedroom, no screens in bed, and heavy meals before bedtime can mess up your sleep schedule too. So first, if during your interview a kid's doing any of these things, um, you want to recommend improving their hygiene. You want to recommend stopping these things. Um, it also helps to sleep in a quiet, dark, cool bedroom, so um, that might help improve their sleep hygiene as well. Next is narcolepsy. Um, narcolepsy is essentially a REM abnormality. It can lead to daytime sleepiness, and uh, then these people have forced daytime naps. There are a couple like characteristics of narcolepsy. First are these hypnopompic and hypnagogic hallucinations. This is a hallucination when you go to sleep, hypnagogic, and hypnopompic is a hallucination as you're waking up. Um, you also notice sleep paralysis in people with narcolepsy. They'll have cataplexy. This is when you have a sudden drop, um, like the dramatic person that falls asleep while walking, a sudden loss of muscle tone. Um, these people can have sleep attacks where they fall asleep for a short period of time, but they wake up really refreshed and ready to go. There's this new diagnostic test, the hypocretin-1 um, from the CSF uh, for narcolepsy. The treatments are modafinil, amphetamines, or planned naps throughout the day have also shown to be helpful. Insomnia is next. So this is patients that can't fall asleep or stay asleep. Um, they might have early mor morning awakenings, and insomnia is often related to anxiety or worsening. So yeah, as I said, associated with anxiety, depression as well. The technical definition uh, for diagnosis is an inability to sleep or an inability to stay asleep for at least three nights a week, ongoing for at least three months. The treatment here is similar to sleep hygiene. You want to improve the sleep hygiene, making sure you're not doing any of these things up here. Um, you also want to make sure there's no underlying anxiety or depression that you need to treat. And there are some medications that help you sleep. I've listed them here in order of increasing strength. Um, so you might start with Benadryl, um, then Ketiapine, Trazodone, Zolpidem is uh, the strongest one. Next is obstructive sleep apnea. This is mostly a structural problem. The risk factors include being male, being overweight, having a thick neck, snoring loudly, and having these apneic episodes at night. Some people say their partner notices them choking or gagging at night. Um, if you're not feeling refreshed after sleeping, that's also another sign. While you're awake, you might have these symptoms. You might be hypertensive, you might have a headache, you might be depressed, you might have bad memory. Um, essentially, the pathophysiology is that your pharyngeal muscles relax and close your airway at night, which leads to hypoventilation during the night. And of course, can lead to hypo, or sorry, hypoxia, low oxygen, hypercapnia, high carbon dioxide. Your body then responds, um, so you have a compensatory metabolic alkalosis, 
And another thing you might see on lab values is a polycythemia, um, essentially your kidneys noticing that you don't have that much oxygen, so they increase EPA production, and now you have high red blood cells. The diagnosis for obstructive sleep apnea is a sleep study, and the treatment tries to address some of these risk factors. So first you could lose weight, um, obviously avoid stimulants. Um, most of these sleep disorders want you to avoid stimulants. A CPAP or a BiPAP machine can work. And the last resort is kind of surgery, so a tonsillectomy, tracheostomy, they essentially open up your airways a little more. If you don't fix obstructive sleep apnea, these patients can get pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to right heart failure. Next is the central sleep apnea. The pathophysiology here is that the brain loses the drive to breathe while sleeping. Uh, it's the same symptoms that we just talked about. Usually the person's a little thinner because they don't necessarily have that obstructive problem in the neck. This is where you see the Cheyenne-Stokes respiration pattern. Uh, where they stop breathing throughout the night and um, they pause breathing in the middle of the night. So you might have a mom or a partner notice that the, uh, ab the abdomen or the chest stop moving when they stop breathing. The fix here is CPAP or BiPAP with backup vents. So in general, these sleep disorders, you can imagine why they would affect a child's performance in school. Um, poor sleep makes a kid uh, either inattentive or irritable or uh, not functioning at their fullest. So that might be a reason for for school problems or for behavioral problems. Next, when thinking about school problems, one of the first things you should think about is sensory impairment. Is the kid able to hear and see well? Um, if they're not, then it's probably not a behavioral problem, it's just a sensory problem. So we do several screens for sensory impairment. It starts at birth, all babies get a hearing screen, and then uh, as we do their developmental milestones, we kind of indirectly assess their vision and hearing. For instance, do they respond to words? Or do they start to say their first words, uh, indicating that they're hearing uh, what we're saying. Do they make eye contact? Stuff like that. We start objective vision and hearing tests at well child checks starting at three and four year old uh, well child checks respectively. So uh, the vision test will be that chart, uh, the Snellen chart with the big E at the top. Um, for kids that don't quite know their letters they have a variation of that chart with shapes so that'll assess their vision, um, assess their hearing as well through a hearing test. We should also consider learning disabilities. Uh, learning disability is a problem with an academic skill. Usually it's a patient with a normal range IQ, not always, that has poor academic achievement in like a specific subject, so like math, reading, writing. Uh, learning disabilities are associated with behavior and attention problems, so if you diagnose one, you should evaluate for the other. So if somebody has a learning disability, you should check to see if they have ADHD. If somebody has ADHD, you might um, check their performance in school to make sure they don't have a learning disability. Um, you can also check for sensory impairment here, so all of these things kind of go together. The red flags for learning disability that might make you think that there's an intellectual disability or something more serious or maybe an organic cause are if uh, the mom abused substances during the, uh, the, during the pregnancy, um, an illness during pregnancy, if the baby had any kind of head trauma or childhood meningitis or pretty bad viral infections, um, if there's any kind of lead exposure during the child's development, or any kind of psychosocial trauma or family history of learning disability that might prompt more evaluations uh, for an intellectual disability. Next is autism. This is kind of a short overview of autism. Autism is pretty early onset. The kids have a problem with language, behavior, and social interactions. The first sign of autism is usually these missed developmental milestones. So the baby might not have a social smile. They might not make eye contact. Uh, the baby can also have delays in developing their speech and language. And as they get older, they might have problems forming and maintaining relationships and they, don't, they won't really have social connections. So these people are, these kids, people are, are typically inflexible to change. Um, they like to stick to a schedule and if that schedule deviates um, from what they expected, they, they'll have problems with that. They don't, they don't do so well. So they have kind of uh, schedule rigidity, behavioral rigidity. Um, they, might, they might also have fixated interests, um, sometimes with really intense focus. And uh, the one, one example of, of autism spectrum disorder is Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory. Um, unfortunately, they laugh at him in that show, but um, he kind of shows some, some like, autism traits. Like he has this schedule that he doesn't want to change. He has a place that he sits and he doesn't want anybody else to sit there. Um, the things that he's interested in, he's very fixated. Um, he's very intense about them. So that's, that's, a, that's a character you might be familiar with. Treatment for autism is you want to get involved as early as possible. The earlier you get involved, the, the better um, it goes. There are several behavioral modification programs that you can um, look into. You want to do speech and language therapy if the kid has problems with those. And you want to socialize the child as early as possible. Next is 
ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. This might be one of the first things that you look for if a kid has behavioral problems or if, if they're not doing so well in school. There's two broad categories here. There's the low, no attention span. This is a kid that doesn't follow instruction, that's forgetful, that's disorganized, that can't focus. And there's the hyperactivity um, side of things, which is a kid that's described as being driven by a motor, overly talkative, fidgety, and interrupts their authority figures. The kid could have uh, either of these or both of these. So you could have combined type ADHD, or you could have the attention deficit type, and you can have the uh, hyperactivity type. So it's, anything is possible. Uh, it's considered ADHD when it interferes with their daily functioning, so that's their social life or their academic life, for at least six months. And to diagnose this, you need to have these symptoms in at least two locations, um, usually before the age of 12. Um, some doctors are pretty strict about having it diagnosed very young. Um, now to diagnose it, there's these survey forms called the Vanderbilt forms that some people use. And you would give these forms to the parents and give these forms to the teachers, and the teachers would fill these out. And if they, uh, if they score high enough on those forms, then that, that warrants a diagnosis of ADHD. The treatment includes stimulants like methylphenidate and dextroamphetamine. There are other meds like this guanfacine and atomoxetine and clonidine that work as well. Some people prefer these other meds because they have less of the side effects of the stimulants. The stimulants might give you insomnia or appetite suppression. There's special education programs for kids with ADHD. And you also want to spend some time educating the, the patient and their parents uh, on what ADHD is, how they can manage it, how it might affect their life, but how it doesn't necessarily um, affect you too much if you if you can manage it if you can treat it there is also behavioral therapy for ADHD so you could add that as well next is oppositional defiant disorder this is characterized by recurrent hostile argumentative negativistic and defiant behavior toward authority figures now this is pretty important the toward authority figures is the key here um, these people might still be friends with their peers um, and that kind of differentiated from conduct disorder which will which we'll discuss next um, but they they really just don't like teachers. They really just don't want to listen to, to parents, to sometimes police, sometimes they're like coach, their sports coach. Um, so, they're, so they're defiant, but they still have friends. They're still pretty social. The treatment here is to teach the parenting skills to the parents. So a lot of this is, um, is like a family effort. If this is unchecked, it can progress to conduct disorder. Conduct disorder is more severe. Uh, it's characterized by aggression, bullying, cruelty. These people hurt animals, they destroy property. Uh, they lie, they cheat, they steal. Um, so this, these are people that are uh, defiant toward authority figures, but also toward their peers. So they might bully their peers, they might be cruel to their peers, or, or hurt their peers. The treatment here is unfortunately detainment. You want to prevent these people from harming others. So juvenile detention centers are probably what you would do for somebody with conduct disorder. You could use antipsychotics um, in extreme cases. These people must turn their life around. If they don't, it can progress to antisocial personality disorder as an adult over 18 years old. And a lot of these people end up in prison. So uh, do as much as you can, as early as you can, likely with a juvenile detention center to try to help these people. Next are these two uh, pretty common mood disorders that don't always affect your ability in school, but um, often can. So first is the mood disorders like major depression. The epidemiology here is around 3% of kids, um, 3 to 17 years old, have a mood disorder. The screen here is PHQ-9. It's a survey that you might do at a well-child check or for a kid that you suspect a uh, mood disorder. The diagnosis of uh, major depression is five of these SIGI caps characteristics. So these are listed here, sleep, uh, low interest, guilt, low energy, um, low concentration, higher low appetite, uh, psychomotor retardation, suicidal ideation. And you can imagine that some of these, the ones I've underlined, especially sleep, interest, energy, and concentration, might affect a child's ability at school, might affect um, their ability to do well in their courses. Um, childhood depression often becomes bipolar disorder in adulthood, so obviously this is something you want to treat as early as possible. There's also an association between mood and ADHD, so screen for the other one um, if you find a mood disorder. The treatment for mood disorders in kids is just like in adults. You'll start with SSRIs and definitely do therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Lastly, anxiety disorder. Epidemiology is around 7.1% of children. The screen here is another survey, the GAD7, that you might uh, give to a patient that seems to be anxious. And there's this other mnemonic, RIF-SIMS, and you need at least three of these um, for an anxiety disorder. Um, this is restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep. And of course, you can imagine that if you're restless, if you can't concentrate, if you can't sleep, 
you might do poorly at school, you might have behavioral problems uh, while you're awake. Um, and the treatment here is similar, SSRIs and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for kids. So this was a video on uh, essentially a differential diagnosis for behavioral problems and for school failure in kids. So if a kid comes in with these problems, you want to consider the things on this list. I hope it was helpful. Thank you for listening.